Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff. Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to be talking about primary subacromial impingement syndrome, secondary impingement, and internal impingement. These are three subtypes of subacromial impingement, and we want to talk about the major differences between all three. And we're going to start by talking about primary impingement. So for primary impingement, let's first understand the mechanism of this condition. Okay, so let's take a look here at this picture. So we have this space in here called the subacromial space. Uh, on top of it, we have the acromion and the subacromial arch, which consists of the acromion, the coracoid process, and the coracoacromial ligament. And then on the inferior part, we really just have the humerus. And this space, and here's the subacromial space. And there are several structures that actually are within that subacromial space. For example, we have the rotator cuff tendons. We have the long head of biceps brachii tendon. We have the subacromial bursa. The subacromial arch really makes up the superior portion of it. And then we have the glenohumeral joint capsule. So all of these structures, to some extent, exist within that subacromial space. And with primary impingement, it's what's called a mechanical impingement. So with mechanical impingement, what we mean is that by some mechanism, the size of that subacromial space is decreased. Okay? Let's think about a way we could decrease the space. Okay? Uh, we could, for example, have the humerus translate superiorly too far. Think about it. The humerus comes up too far superiorly. Now there's less space for these structures in here because there's less space between the top of the humerus right there and the acromion. We could also, in the anteroposterior direction, we could have the capsule being tight of the glenohumeral joint. If the capsule's tight in one direction, then when the structures have to move anteriorly or posteriorly, they're going to be restricted in whatever direction the tightness of the capsule is. Okay? So let's take a look at some of the specific causes of primary impingement. Let's first talk about rotator cuff tendinopathy, which implies weakness of those muscles. By the way, I have a video on this where we go into this concept in a lot more detail in another video. I'll link it in the description, but if you need more help with that, go watch it. But the basic idea is, if we take a look at the rotator cuff muscles in the deltoid, the deltoid, in addition to abducting the shoulder, has a superior pull on the humerus. Most of the rotator cuff muscles, like subscapularis, infraspinatus, and teres minor, have an inferior pull on the humerus. And so if we want vertical stability of the humerus, meaning not to go up too far or down too far, then the inferior forces due to the rotator cuff muscles have to balance with the superior force of the deltoid. So if the rotator cuff muscles become weak, what happens to this inferior pull on the humerus? It decreases. And so now we have more superior pull on the humerus due to the deltoid, and so the humerus is going to move up superiorly too much. Remember what we just mentioned. One of the ways we could decrease the size of the subacromial space is to have the humerus come up too far superiorly, and that can be due to rotator cuff weakness. Another issue can just be the morphology of the acromial process. Okay, there's three types of acromions. There's a straight kind like this, type 1. There's a slightly bent or curved one, which is type 2, and then a hooked one that's type 3. And notice what happens to that subacromial space as you get more and more curvature in the acromion. Subacromial space actually decreases in size. So individuals with a type 3 acromion or hooked acromion have a smaller subacromial space and are going to be more likely to have primary impingement. Also, if the person has posterior capsule tightness in the glenohumeral joint, um, it's going to restrict movements of elements of that joint posteriorly. For example, whenever you go into shoulder abduction, remember some of the kinematics that occur. Remember that the acromion has to move posteriorly to get out of the way of the humerus. Additionally, this will further if you have external rotation. And so if the posterior capsule is tight, it's going to limit movement of things posteriorly. And if those things are limited and you're still going into abduction of the shoulder, now you're having things crash into each other and the size of the subacromial space decreases. 
Postural dysfunction, meaning excess kyphosis of the thoracic spine, causes the scapula to protract excessively, and this also causes a similar effect to posterior capsule tightness. And so in general, what you can see here, other than the things we can't help, which are the genetics of the acromion, we can either have muscle imbalances, so a strength problem with the rotator cuff, or just generalized stiffness. So posterior capsule stiffness, um, we can have stiffness in the thoracic spine that causes problems in the shoulder joint. Also notice that the pain for primary impingement syndrome is typically going to be on the lateral or anterolateral shoulder. And sometimes that pain can actually go down to the elbow. Also notice that secondary impingement, which we'll get to in a couple minutes, has a similar pain location to primary impingement, but what we'll see is the mechanism of that is very different and doesn't involve stiffness. Now let's take a look at the test item cluster, how you test for primary impingement. The first is the external rotation resistance test, also called infraspinatus muscle test. They're the same thing. The second is the painful arc test, and the third is the Hawkins to Kennedy test. If you have a positive result on all three of these, it's associated with a positive likelihood ratio for primary impingement of 10.56, which is very, very powerful. So very good at ruling up primary impingement. There's also another test here that's useful for further ruling it up, NEARS test. But notice this is not a part of this test item cluster. It's only these three tests. Also notice that when you're looking at this versus just purely rotator cuff uh, tendinopathy, Notice that the test item cluster is very similar. You still have the infraspinatus muscle test and the painful arc test, but instead of the Hawkins-Kennedy test for pure rotator cuff, it's the drop arm test. Again, the test is very similar because primary impingement can still involve rotator cuff weakness. Also notice that secondary impingement involves really the same anatomical structures as primary impingement. It can involve the rotator cuff tendons, the long head of biceps brachii tendon, the subacromial bursa and arch, and the glenohumeral joint capsule. Now, let's switch gears and start talking about secondary impingement and internal impingement. These two conditions are actually fairly similar to one another. There's a couple key differences that we'll talk about in a couple minutes. What I wanna first mention though is that secondary impingement is very different than primary impingement. Remember with primary impingement, yes, you can have muscle imbalances like the rotator cuff muscles being weaker than the deltoid, or we can have things that we can't really help like a hooked acromion. But remember with primary impingement, a couple of the issues we might have would be posterior capsule tightness and postural dysfunction. If we think of postural dysfunction, take a look at this picture right here. Uh, with postural dysfunction, notice the person's thoracic spine, particularly upper thoracic spines, in hyperkyphosis. And so that forces the scapula to be too much protracted, even at rest. And so when we try to do movements like horizontal abduction or lateral flexion or extension of the humerus, extension of the shoulder joint, those structures are going to have issues moving posteriorly. And so it's going to compress the size of that subacromial space. Again, a mechanical type of compression. For postural dysfunction, take a look at this picture right here. So this person has a hyperkyphotic upper thoracic spine. Um, and so in this case, the scapula are too far protracted at rest. And so when the person tries to go into movements like extension of the shoulder or horizontal abduction or lateral flexion, whatever you want to call it, those movements are going to cause the size of that subacromial space to decrease because when the scapulas are too far forward like this, then these structures are going to have issues moving posteriorly and it's going to cause compression of that subacromial space. Again, with posterior capsule tightness, remember with this, again, if the posterior capsule is tight during movements like abduction and external rotation, where structures do have to move posteriorly, they're going to be limited in how far they can move back. Again, that's going to decrease the size of the subacromial space. So these two things in particular seem to be more stiffness problems. Whereas when we go and look at secondary impingement and internal impingement, the overall thing is not stiffness, it's more laxity. So let's take a look at the patient presentation for secondary impingement. The patient's young, although that's not a perfect differentiating factor. Um, you could still be young and have primary impingement. Um, there's pain with overhead activities, although again, that's not going to be a differentiating factor because also notice 
internal impingement has the same thing. And if you go back and look up at primary impingement, they also have pain with overhead activities. Uh, but one thing, or two things I should say, would be history of instability, and then also generalized laxity. So again, that's just kind of laxity that's not confined to the shoulder. It could You could find laxity all over the body. Okay, so the key with secondary impingement over primary is now we're dealing with more laxity and instability. And when we look at the objective findings, we're going to start kind of moving away from just rotator cuff weakness. And now we're going to start thinking about aberrant scapula movements. So scapular dyskinesis. So where there's imbalances between the movements of the scapula. For example, too much upward rotation and not enough downward rotation. If those are imbalanced, we might have aberrant scapular movements. Um, even the muscles that stabilize the scapula might be weak. So for example, take a look at this patient's left scapula. It's sticking too far out as evident by the medial border right here. And that's probably because some of the muscles that stabilize the scapula against the posterior rib cage are weak. And that leads to aberrant scapular positioning and movement. And also here, the anterior joint capsule of the glenohumeral joint might have hypermobility. So it's no longer a stiff capsule, it's hypermobile. And as a result of hypermobility, at the shoulder joint, we're going to have positive instability tests. So again, if we look down here for secondary impingement, one of the ways we're going to differentiate this over primary impingement is the presence of positive instability tests. We'll be covering those in the next video. Also notice for internal impingement, there's also positive instability tests. So what's the major difference between secondary and internal impingement? And take a look here at the objective findings. They're almost identical. Look down here at internal impingement. Okay, we still have hypermobility of the anterior glenohumeral joint capsule. Scapular stabilizers are weak. Um, shoulder girdle muscles are weak in general, and they're producing that aberrant scapular movement. We still have positive instability tests. But the two major differentiating factors of internal impingement from secondary is an in internal impingement, we're going to have a positive posterior impingement test. That's not something that we would really have in a secondary impingement. And the reason we have a positive posterior impingement test has to do with the fact of where the pain is and the mechanism of internal impingement. So look at secondary impingement up here. The location of the pain is lateral or anterolateral shoulder, and sometimes it goes down to the elbow. Notice that's the same as primary impingement. But with internal impingement, the pain is actually on the posterior shoulder, and that's because of the tissues involved. It's really the underside of the supraspinatus and infraspinatus tendons. So for example, when you go into external rotation, so if you basically bring your arm up to 90 degrees and go into an external rotation position and even go beyond 90 degrees external rotation as if you're about to throw a baseball pitch, uh, the underside of these two tendons can actually bump into and hook on the glenoid rim and that causes internal impingement. But because those tendons tend to rotate backwards when you go into that excess external rotation, the pain's gonna be more on the posterior side of the shoulder, not anterolateral or lateral as it is in primary and secondary. So if a patient comes in and they complain more of pain on the posterior shoulder, then immediately you start thinking more internal impingement versus secondary. Okay. Again, secondary and internal are both going to have instability and, in, and positive instability tests. Also with internal impingement, again, there tends to be aberrant throwing mechanics, and the patient may be more of an athlete that performs overhead throwing type of activities. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.